Hey, what's up, guys? It's Dan from United Q. It's Wednesday. We seems to have another awesome podcast to get you over hump day. I'm here with my co-host, Ben. Hello. And we're brought to you by ProQ, Barbecue Gourmet, Kamado Joe, and Smoke with Shack, our awesome sponsors. ProQ is dedicated to providing you with quality smoking products with top-notch service and free advice for beginners to pit masters. And you can find them on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram under ProQ Smokers. So if you're thinking about buying your first smoker, wanting to upgrade, or looking for authentic charcoal commercial smokers and cabinet smokers check them out over at max barbecue and barbecue gourmet is devoted to promoting real barbecue inspiring the uk and europe with top championship winning barbecue rubs sauces marinades and accessories from the us and around the world and you can find them on twitter and online under barbecue gourmet so regardless of how you cook whether it's on charcoal wood gas or electric the real taste of barbecue can be yours all year round and Kamali joe is renowned for build quality and innovation from smoking roasting and searing Kamali joe is the premium ceramic grill chosen by Michelin star chefs and barbecue enthusiasts alike. Kamado Joe's patented technology lets you cook with the confidence and stay in complete control. Get that real barbecue taste and keep the moisture locked in your food. Check out KamadoJoe.co.uk plus Facebook and Twitter. And on today's show, we have Natalie from IOSN. Hello, Natalie. Hello, how are you? Great, great to have you on. Good, thank you. Well, I did my hair specially um, for you, so thank you. <laughs> I thought the space buns were a nice touch. What do you think? Yeah, perfect. <laughs> Works really well on radio. <laughs> yeah, I thought so. Thanks. <laughs> so could you start off by just telling us a little bit, a bit about yourself and about Ayoshen, the brand, please? Yeah, of course. Um, well, Ayoshen is quite um, a baby, I suppose, in, in terms of nice. Um, that are available on the market. I mean, you've got generational brands like Wurstoff and Henkels and Victorian Ox and Global, and they've been around for, you know, absolutely ages. I mean, decades, if not, you know, properly generations. So in the grand scheme of things, Ayashen is really quite um, young. Um, and I would say it's probably about 14 years old. I kind of lose track because it, it, sort of, it sort of came in a in a sort of a, a back doorway with a different business that I had. But... Um, yeah, it's, it's been quite a ride, actually, launching the brand. But, you know, when the product is as good as it, um, well, I know it is, it, it's, it's actually not a particularly hard thing to do to sell it because a lot of people, once you've got the knife in your hand, it's, it, you can't change to another knife brand. It really is. It's, it's like an addiction. <laughs> you ask anybody that's got an eyes and knife, it, it, I almost sell them a knife and go, I'm really, really sorry about this because... I've started something now, and um, you know you just just won't be able to stop. It's yeah, quite I good think fun. Definitely so. true. Like we see so many people in the food world and the barbecue world, I guess, that have started off with one, and before you know it, their drawers are filling up. They yeah. to create more space <laughs> for more Ayoshen knives. Yeah, they have to buy new right knife rolls, or you know, it, it is quite amusing. But you know, sometimes it is the answer to. Um, Certainly the significant other half prayers because, you know, um, let's face it, knives are kind of a guy thing. I mean, it, that is very, very pigeonholy. But I would say that a lot of my customers are men. Um, and men are historically really awful to buy for, really difficult. So, of course, you know, the, the other halves are going, thank God, you know, that, that's Christmas and birthdays wrapped up for the next five years. I'm done. It's absolutely brilliant. But, uh, yeah, it, it's, um, it's definitely a, an addiction in, in that sort of sense. But... I don't know whether you guys have ever tried one. Have you ever had yeah, a go? Yeah, we have. We, um, we used them on the Great British Barbecue Off show because you supplied us them for That's all the contestants right. to use. Yes. So we have yeah. used them and we think they're awesome. Thank yeah, you. love them. Thank you very much. Good. Thank you very much. <laughs> a lot of, uh, a lot of that, our though, friends. <laughs> yeah, well, we don't. No, no, definitely not. We don't. <laughs> no, we don't have to. We've, we've only, you're the first knife brand that we've even had on the podcast because we oh liked it God, so much that we you. wanted to speak to you. Oh, well, I'm really honoured. Thanks very much. It's, um, it's a pleasure to be here. But, um, yeah, no, it's, um, it's definitely been, um, it's, it's a roller coaster of a ride, that's for sure. It, it didn't, Diashen wasn't even a, a brand when, um, when it started, as it were. I don't know whether you guys know the history behind the no, brand. No, please, yeah. please. Uh, uh, well, I don't want to bore the pants off you, but, um, you know, it's, it's kind of a nice story. Um, my, my dad has got pretty much, I've got, him thank for everything that that sort of happened you know in the last 15 years um he was uh, a really passionate foodie really into his food 
Um, and again, I bought him a global knife, as <laughs> we all did, because I couldn't figure out what to buy him for his birthday. And, um, you know, he absolutely loved it. You know, fell in love with this knife. I felt like the best daughter in the world because I've got him something that he actually used for a change. Um, you know, change from like car cleaning <laughs> kits and all that sort of stuff. Um, and, um, you Link, know, obviously. Links deodorant set or something. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. God bless Christmas. Um, and, um, I, you know, was really, really happy, obviously, that he got a present that he liked. But, you know, as every knife does, every knife blunts. Um, depending on how, uh, hard the steel is will depend on how long it holds its cutting edge for. But, you know, the global went blunt um after a period of time i can't remember how much it was it wasn't that long but it wasn't that short either um and so i bought him a butcher steel diamond steels wet stones you know all manner of nice sharpening equipment you know the pull through job is just to try and get that back you know of course you know that filled another christmas and another birthday and what have you um but he couldn't get that global back to box sharp which was quite frustrating to be fair um, so he went on the internet and found a little knife sharpening machine from this company called Nairi slash Iogen. Um, bought it direct, a <laughs> single unit, which makes me laugh now because I buy them in thousands. I have container loads that <laughs> I buy now. Um, and uh, he was just like a sharpening maniac. Honestly, he was sharpening his knives, neighbors' knives, my knives. Could not get enough of this little dinky machine. Um, he'd retired from his previous job he had a really successful business um doing something completely different had some money set aside for retirement and um basically thought you know this this is an incredible piece of kit i can you know we can sell this to the uk um but he had no marketing experience whatsoever in fact he's terrible at marketing or was terrible and um he asked if i could come on board and help him so he had the sort of sales experience i had the marketing and publicity experience and together we bought this little gadget to the UK and um, it was great and um, we had a nice business with the domestic knife sharpening machine selling through um, Lakeland actually mainly through Lakeland but sort of individual cook shops and what have you yeah and then we uh, decided to import a commercial knife sharpening machine which is destined for butchers for restaurants for commercial establishments um, in fact Tesco's uh, took thousands of units from it so that was really really great because it was a good profit deal and we were congratulating ourselves on being so brilliant and uh, <laughs> suddenly IHN said uh, by the way or Nairi as they are said uh, we actually are first and foremost a knife manufacturer and um, would you accept these gifts as a thank you for being such great customers and you know getting our products into the western world um, and we took them back and tried them and they were just 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 phenomenal um, I'd never come across a knife like it, and, and having a knife sharpening machine company, you come across all different style of knives, you know, whether it be German, Japanese, European, American, you sharpen everything because you need to know how the steel's going to react when you're training people or selling the product. I'd never come across anything like it in my life, and that was one of those moments where it's a crossroads, do you or don't you? Um, the samples that we had were, some of them were bamboo handles, some of them were rosewood handle. They looked awful. The boxing was just gross. And there's no branding, but the blades would, they just flew out of the water. So um, over a bottle of wine one night, my dad and I decided to um, purchase a range of seven knives and brand them and box them and sell them out to the UK under the, the IHN name. So that awesome. was so how IHN was born. <laughs> so like the whole, the way the handles and everything are is like your own styling now is... Shen, yeah, than, was it yeah. Nara, I mean, um, there, there, are, there was Mark One knife, um, which actually had the three rivet look. You know, like if you look at a Wusthof or a Henkel, they've got the three dots going yeah. up there. Um, and that was the, the first one we did. It was, it had a German feel to it, but it, it just had the three rivet look. Um, and the very first person to, famous person, she said air quoting, not that you can see me, um, famous person to use Shen on TV was Gary Rhodes on the very first Great British Menu. And he had his Irish in knives, and I was really excited because this was like our first chance to get these knives on TV. But under the studio lights, you can't see the branding on the blade, and the handle looked like a German knife. It was just, you know, the, the disappointment was just, ah, oh, just, I remember it to this day. Yeah, so so no I one can went, tell what it is. <laughs> no one can tell, and it was all that work. And, 
I don't know. It, it, it wasn't wasted because people kind of knew who Ayrshire was, but just mm. on TV, it just it just wasn't showing up. So, with my marketing hat on, I uh, decided to design a new handle for Ayrshire, which was quite costly because I had a load of knives with the old handle that I had yeah, to. Okay. No, I didn't junk them. Get you know, don't get me wrong, but we did, you know I had to sell those off cheap to fund this new you know handle endeavour. And uh, but it was the making of the brand because now you can't mistake an Ayrshire knife. You you, you really can't. No, no, no. You see them all the time now, don't you? Yeah. Just like, Massively oh, identifiable. Look, he's got ISN. Oh, Jamie Oliver's got an ISN there. It's, you can see it, can't you? Yeah, yeah. He posted something on Instagram the other day of um, his son, Buddy, chopping some herbs. Yeah. And you can see the swirl <laughs> at the back. Yeah. And he posted something um, a good couple of years ago now, actually, with um, his knife drawer. And every knife was an ISN knife. And it's really, you know, he's such a nice guy. I know he gets a lot of bashing, but he's such a nice bloke. Um, and he just, helps us out because he he knows you know he knows the story he knows um what we're all about and he also likes the product as well and in fact in before his stores um closed down the um recipes stores we were the only non jamie oliver brand to actually be sold within his stores because he specifically asked for our shame to be stocked wow. which is great because awesome. yeah. he has his own nice brand yeah <laughs> but yours so. is better <laughs> <laughs> well, they are. I mean, scientifically, they are. Um, yeah. There's no choice about it. You know, they they they, they trounce. You know that. But, but you know, his knives. You know, hit a certain um, market. They're priced differently. You know, so it's it's he's sort of hitting the mass domestic market, whereas I'm not in that sort of sense. Although there are obviously touches. But um, you know, a lot of people look at a knife and just go, eighty pounds. Oh my God, I'm not spending eighty pounds on a knife. You know, and they'll go for like a, a cheap can recon plastic, you know, the, well, the colour-coded ones with a sheet on it because I think that's good value. And that's fine because they're not my customer. But, no. you know, that's absolutely fine. You know. But they'll be buying one of those every six months or they'll just be putting up with it being blunt forever, won't they? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, and it's funny because it, it's normally the lady, as again, I'm talking about the good food show now because this is where I really get to get to know who the customer is in that sense. Although... Obviously, I speak to people a lot on Twitter, but face-to-face -face sales is really, really great because you really get to understand what people in shops have to deal with on a daily basis. Mm. And some of the questions you get asked, oh, my God, you know, sometimes you're like, you just can't believe that these people are walking and breathing. Some of the questions are just so dim. <laughs> and you just, oh. But it's those people that, you know, look at, you know, they'll pick up um, a Santuku blade and just fall completely in love with it and go, oh, how much is it? And they'll say, well, it's £90. And they'll just, you can see them, you know, their jaws drop. And oh, I thought it'd be about 15. And I'm like, well, <laughs> you know, this is like, you know, the Rolls Royce of knives. You can look at a Rolls Royce and go, you know, yeah, I'll give you 15 grand for it. You know, it's just like, oh. I, I actually know. think for, for what they are, the Irish N range is, yeah, not, is not that bad. Is not that bad yeah. No. I think price wise, I mean, when you're looking at, at knives now, the global knife market, I don't think Irish N is, is for, for what you're getting as well, the quality of the knife, I don't think that it's. it's Mm. Priced high at all, to be honest. No, and and that's kind of it. it you're absolutely right, and we're almost too cheap for what we are in, in that sort yeah. of sense because they're handcrafted. Um, the technical side of things is they're made of three layers of steel. The the cutting edge, which is the middle layer, is made with the highest and hardest grade of stainless steel that you can't ever manufacture. It's it's um, rated for hardness on a Rockwell scale and. Rockwell 62 hardness, which is a really weird number, but Rockwell 62 is the hardest you can manufacture thing of steel. There, it's like the boiling. If you've got a kettle and it's boiling, um, that boiling point is 100 degrees Celsius. That's it. It doesn't get to 101, 102. That is the cutoff point. It's the ceiling point, and the ceiling point for steel is Rockwell 62 hardness. But on its own, and left, you know, as a knife blade on its own, Rockwell 62 is incredibly brittle. It's too fragile and you couldn't throw it around a commercial kitchen you couldn't throw it around anywhere without it shattering or breaking so that's why the, the two layers on the outside sandwich it to protect it so you can treat it like a normal knife but actually without sounding really salesy because i hate sounding like this but it is the ultimate knife it's got a japanese edge it's 15 degree angle it's got the hardest steel you can possibly manufacture um is it that is that's your ultimate knife and you know, the balance of the knife and the feel of the handle, that's an individual choice. So if you said to me, um, let's, oh, I don't know, let's not global bash, let's choose somebody else. Let's choose Wustoff, for example. I love Wustoff, big respect for them. 
But if you said to me, you've got an eight inch worst off and an eight inch um, IHN, you say, well, actually, that, that, they're, they're either as sharp as each other or the worst off is sharper. I have science to back it up. In fact, it's all over the worst off website that their Rockwell rating is 57. Ours is 62. And you think, well, what's, you know, what's five little points? Actually, it's massive. In the grand scheme of things and, and to the longevity of the knife and how it feels in your hand, it's huge. It really is. And, um, you know, coupled with the Japanese edge and the weight of a German knife, it's just magic. <laughs> it's stupid. It's just a knife. But it is magic when you use it. And, you know, it, it never fails. You can probably hear me sort of smiling now. It never fails to make me smile when I you know, do a, a demonstration at Good Future and just watching people's reaction, especially when you sort of balance a knife on a tomato and you can, you're holding it with your, your sort of fingertips and you just pull it back towards you and the knife just drops through the, the tomato. You can see their faces. So rewarding that that simple demonstration just in one sort of nutshell um, shows people how good the knife is. Yeah, but it's quite, it's quite obvious how passionate you are about, and, <laughs> uh, I mean, about the knives and about the brand and I mean that's great to see I mean it's great to hear when you speak to people sometimes and they're selling something or they, they run something they own something they own their rights to to selling it in the UK or, or whatever it may be and it's a bit like oh yeah it's, it's great no passion, yeah. is it? it's there's no passion you can but, feel but you, you love yeah. this product you can really I do I do and it's not it's not just me it's, it's in I've, I've seen how they've been made I've, I've watched them be handcrafted and you know, if that doesn't move you as as a person in sales, then uh, you know you're made of stone. Seriously, and you know, I remember you're made of rock it was sixty two. You're rock <laughs> sixty two. Oh, I love it. Brilliant. I'm going to use that by the way <laughs> and, and claim it as my own as well. I hope you don't mind. Right, it's on the um, podcast now. You, <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here first, guys. Yeah. <laughs> I, Sorry, um, you can send us a wasn't... knife every time you yeah. say it. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, small, small royalty. <laughs> <laughs> Use it oh dear, it's gone it's gone off no, sorry off um no it's fine um i was gonna oh yes yeah, i was gonna say that when i went to um i said not this year but year before um we had a tour of the factories we always do because you always see little snippets of production that you miss or they haven't been doing the last time you're there and i sort of broke off from the group and watched this guy and he was working on a part of the handle and, and there are a hundred different processes to make the handle alone on, on ISO knives because it's all oh, it's so complicated. Um, and he was working on one particular part of the handle, just buffing it down, rounding it off, making it more ergonomic. And he was on this machine and he sort of buffed it and took it and looked at it and checked it and he wasn't happy and he went back and he buffed it again and, you know, he kept going back to this one spot and he would not let that knife go until he was completely happy with that one section of that handle. And he didn't know I was there. He wasn't doing it for the cameras. He was just doing his job. And I I was just blown away. In fact, he gave me goosebumps. I know it sounds ridiculous, but it just the, the amount of care and love and attention that this guy put into this knife, it was like he was making it for the Queen. You know, he had no idea where that was going, what hands it was destined for. But he was, was so... Um, passionate about what he was doing and I went back into the boardroom and I was, I, one of the things on my agenda points was lead times because it takes six months for me between um, ordering and delivery to, to get these knives and um, I, I, I was trying to find ways to cut down the lead time because sometimes I run out of knives if there's a particular push on TV or somebody's written an article on it and I just went back and I just completely, I just struck it off the agenda. I said, you know what, as long as you keep doing what you're doing, I'll forecast better. I'll, I'll buy more stock. I'll, <laughs> I'll do whatever it takes. Just, you, you know, crack on and just keep that level of commitment and quality um, in what you're doing. And I'll, I'll, I'll figure the rest out because it was just, uh, it was amazing to watch, actually, yeah, I have to say. say you don't want to, don't want to sacrifice the quality or anything on the product just so you can get a few more products in the in your, no, in your shop exactly. so you, you'd rather have the best quality possible for everyone well it takes it doesn't take much to ruin a reputation and mm. you know you could take years to build it up but one you know one bad batch or you know somebody i don't know has a proper problem with it you know it just you know people's confidence in in the brand can be shaken to the point where they decide not to so um yeah no it was, it was really important so yeah they are too cheap <laughs> yeah. they really really are but i made a commitment to the end user and at the time the end user was um chefs 
Uh, and chefs particularly don't get paid very much until you sort of scale the ranks and get higher up the ladder. Um, and I wanted to get the best knives possible out there in, you know, at the, at the best price possible that I could do into the hands of these chefs that don't earn all that money. And, and you know, they're the ones that, that I'm, I'm thinking of every time. And even, I mean, I bought ridiculous amounts of dollars before um, Brexit <laughs> because the dollar rate, you know, because I, I, dollars is just a commercial currency. It's just everything's done in dollars. And I bought a load before Brexit. I mean, far too much. I sort of went a bit nuts on it. But just to try and secure that rate so that I don't have to put the prices up so the end user doesn't have to mm. suffer. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. And the, <laughs> and the dollar flew up, so quid's in. <laughs> yeah, oh, the dollar right now. Is, I look, in fact, you know, tonight, I know, I'm completely going off, but I've got an email from my brokers. They're working all night to react to the, um, the presidential yeah. elections. Yeah. Could be uh, an I might give my one. broker a call later on yeah. to see how she's doing. But, yeah. So they are too cheap, but mm. also there's there's no um, links in the chain. So there's Irish M, there's me, there's um, a cook shop, whoever that may be, and then the end user. So there's not you know a fleet of salespeople with flashy BMWs and you know what have you. That you know you haven't got a, a manufacturer and then a European agent and then a UK agent and then you know you haven't got that distribution line. So I can afford to get what should be a hundred and sixty quid knife out for about a hundred. Yeah. And that's basically that's basically it. So yeah. people, when they buy Arjen, are getting really good for money. Um, and I, I think that everybody knows that. Well, hopefully they do. <laughs> yeah. And where where do people, you said they buy it from a cook shop. Can you buy it online on Arjen's website or do you, do you need to go through a shop? Yeah, no, we don't sell direct. We sell um, via cook shops. So, you know, Lakeland, Suma Trading, your independent cook shops around the country. I've got sort of clusters you know, down in the southwest, there's Lawson's in the Midlands, there's sort of a Braxis and, and, and Clarence cook shop. And, and there's lots of cluster cook shops. And there's a store locator on the website, but I really just sort of push all inquiries to them. Yeah. Um, and then they can, you know, the person can walk into the shop and try the knife. And, you know, there's a little bit more contact, but they are online. They're on Amazon, but they're carefully selected um, custom, you know, uh, outlets on there. So we don't. I don't sell to um, cowboys, as it were, with a really bad service record and stuff. Oh, that doesn't affect me. I'm going to sell. Yeah, now I was going to say, I saw them in a... Look, we got Lawson's in Plymouth uh, down here, and I've seen them in there. So, yeah. Oh, brilliant. Well, I'm, I'm in Plymouth next week, actually. Cool. Come oh. Say hello. I am. Cool. Going to see hi to the, hi to, hi to the guys. I mean, they, you know, uh, cook shops, um, for example, they constantly need... Um, again, I'm air quoting, you can't see it, but servicing. So they need um, a representative from us, so basically type them myself or Joe, who's me sounding like I've got a fleet of people, either myself or Joe, or go to a cook shop and, and um, retrain or give refresher training to staff who might have forgotten some of the technicalities about why Iogen's so great or what's the difference between an Iogen and a Global or an Iogen and a Worstoff, whatever it might be. Um, or, or train new staff who haven't got a clue about knives, you know. And then that training is quite all-encompassing and I'll train them on, you know, what, who who should be buying a Global and who should be buying a Worstoff and who should be buying a Henkels and, you know, just helping them be more confident with the knives because um, at the end of the day, if if they make a sale, if even if it's not on an ISN, they still made a sale. That means that their business is still operating, which means I still have an outlet. So as long as somebody buys something from them, then, you know, I'm happy. Yeah. I mean, that's massively important because we have a friend, not mentioning any names, but a brand that has been sold in a uh, by a large sort of national recognized uh, company. And, and he walked into one of the stores and basically... Uh, just coincidentally inquired about one of his like items and and the information that was given was just like useless useless <laughs> and crazy almost so i mean he actually like in the end decided to withdraw his product because he couldn't have it being sold in that in that way so it is really important that that you go to these places i suppose and uh, make sure they've got the right knowledge and they've got the information to pass on to the end user that you want to have it's really important for the brand i guess as well it really is. And, you know, the other thing is that, you know, the, the cook shops, the people that work in them, they are in the cold face and they are dealing with um, the general public, let's say. Uh, and they do get, you know, hassle. Um, and they are, you know, 
you know, any job that's customer facing, there are ups and downs, real highs and lows. And so when they know that they've got the, the support and the backing and then somebody can actually be bothered to get in their car and drive to see them, yeah. the feeling of goodwill stretches sort of far beyond the knowledge, as it were. And they might go, do you know what? I, I want to sell an Irish enough. I can't remember why, <laughs> um, but I, I met Natalie and, and I had a really good time and we had a really fun training session and, and I think I can remember some bits. But, you know, it, it's about getting people to, you know, um, not only like the brand, but uh, you know, and understand the sort of technicalities about it, but want to be want to sell it for you. Yeah, it's like you, know? you having your passion for it. If you can develop that passion with with others, then I mean, with passion, you don't need to sell something. If someone's got a passion about something, if someone believes in in something, they don't actually need to sell it. I mean, it's one of those things that just comes natural. You can tell when you're with someone and they're trying to force sell something to you, or if you're with someone and actually you can actually tell that they love something. Yeah, and that definitely. It really makes that difference, and you can really, really see it. And and yeah, so I d- yeah. definitely agree. Yeah, no, uh, it's a key. It really is a key to to retail sales. Um, selling at the Good Food Show when it's it's Joe and myself, and we have a, a sort of a, a team of volunteers who do it because they love Irish and Irish, which is actually really quite cool. Um, <clears throat> shout out to my mate Karen who comes down from Chester all the time. <laughs> She's so cool. Shout um, out to Karen. Karen. <laughs> yeah, you can. Um, it's just, it's, it's really nice because you, 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 it's so easy to just stand there and just go, well, I'll tell you what, you, you do the work and, and, and the, the, the customer will pick up the knife and do the work and they can ask you, I mean, when you've got somebody who's asking really intelligent questions, it's so fantastic because they've like done now. their research before and, and they know what they want and they just need a bit of guidance and that's really helpful. But <laughs> you do get some, um, yeah, you do get some, <laughs> this shows, which is just funny. I think we'll skip over that. I, the, the amount of cut fingers, though, is just it's hilarious. And the good feature is quite boozy as well. It's a, it's you know, it's I there's a wine section. <laughs> 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 it's a brilliant show. I'd love to be a punter walking around. And yeah, uh, Ben always cuts is, himself, yeah. and I always and I like to drink, so we, we might come yeah. up. <laughs> Yeah, plasters at the like, wedding. Yeah, ben, yeah. Ben's, uh, Ben's renowned for a uh, blue, fas- blue plaster on his finger at uh, cooking shows at events. So, <laughs> so yeah, I don't think I've ever seen myself without a blue plaster <laughs> on any cooking event. <laughs> Well, sharp knives and alcohol really don't mix. And come the end of the day, when people are completely liquored up, um, it's it can be a little bit scary. And, I, you know, sometimes you just have to go, listen, you know, let's just call it a day. <laughs> Give it you can't talk, let alone hold a knife. So, like, come see me tomorrow. <laughs> go use the whistle, so you can cut yourself with those. But, but no. these... <laughs> <laughs> these, though... <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> Where did you say? Where did you say? I went mute. <laughs> <laughs> oh god! Yeah, we'll probably get abused for that as well. But anyway, uh, <laughs> moving on. Right. So let's let's bring it back to because I know I know you've got a passion for for barbecue and outdoor sort of cooking. Mm. Wait, where did that come from? Well, do you know what? I hate to sound like a broken record, but my dad again. Um, uh, not many people know this, but my dad used to be a racing driver. Cool. And um, I grew up on the race circuit, so literally born into racing. He retired when I was 16. And so we sort of, in fact, my brother's name is Mallory, uh, named after Mallory Park, because that's where he won his first race. Um, family joke is that I wasn't called Donington L or, um, <laughs> yeah, or Snetterton S or something like that. But um, so on the race circuit, it, I, did, I, I was thinking about this the other day, actually. I don't remember seeing a gas barbecue at all in the, in the paddocks. It was always, you know, and that's the only way you cooked was on, on barbecues. Um, now, I sort of obviously grew up and, and sort of as a young kid, you know, God bless the 80s, but you just you could just run around in a paddock, you know, and just do your own thing, even as a small child. I mean, you learn to look left and right, otherwise you got run over by the racing cars. But, if, you know, that my job was, um, as I sort of grew up, was to be in charge of cooking, um, and it wasn't, you know, misdomesticated because, you know, we all had certain jobs and if I wasn't, you know, sort of cleaning on polishing the racing car or sorting my dad's helmet out or uh, as I got older, I would go into the pit with the timers so my job was to time the competition. You know, I would um, be cooking for the engineers, cooking for my dad and and that's where the, the love of outdoor cooking came from. It, you know, the smell of barbecue is, for me, so evocative um, and I will... 
it's just something you're born with, I think. You just sort of, when you sort of grow up uh, loving the outdoors. And yeah, we used to go camping all the time and it was always barbecue. Um, and, and yeah, so again, my dad has got a lot to answer for. Awesome. Cool. <laughs> but he was quite adventurous and taught me quite a lot of things on, on, on the barbecue. And, but I'm still a novice, I have to say, when I see what's going on. I mean, you know, Marcus at Countrywood Smoke, he is just my idol. Um, and you know, he started this forum on Facebook and, you know, he's responsible for me trying a lot of stuff and you see, you know, let's, let's bring it really basic beer can burgers, right? I've never even seen this. <laughs> and I made sliders the other day and, you know, I don't got that from the, the, the barbecue forum. I know it's really basic and, and, but I tell yeah, you I what, they tasted awesome. And I felt so proud of myself that I'd actually made something from this forum, but the, the, the meat that's being churned out on social is just, incredible yeah. so i do not ever put myself in that bracket i i'm i'm a voyeur i'd love to get better <laughs> i think marcus ought to have classes now I'll, I'll sign up for a whole season of them <laughs> uh, there you go marcus <laughs> yeah that. <laughs> either that or dr sweet smoke and teach me because he's um again he's just what he does is just it blows my head off you know the pictures that he puts on and the equipment that he uses is just it's staggering his food is just staggering so uh yeah yeah he's an awesome go. guy as well yeah Sorry? Oh, he's, yeah, he's he is. He's also yeah, an awesome yeah. guy. <laughs> yeah. He's so much fun. Oh, my God. I met him for the first time. We've talked for years and years and years, but I met him for the first time at Mutopia. Oh, my gosh, Mutopia is really good fun. I really enjoyed that. First time this year, so I know I'm sort of, you know, probably everybody's like, yeah, I've been for like four years in a row, you know, <laughs> just catching on to it now. But I have to say it was just brilliant. But I met him for the first time at Mutopia, and I spent the entire day just in stitches. Yeah, and my stomach ached, I swear to God. He was just the funnest guy to hang around with. <laughs> He's really great. So, <laughs> exhausting. Oh, my God. It, it's like going to a gym, I swear to God, because you just, he's constantly got you laughing. But, yeah, he's, he's brilliant. I love his pieces. So what, what barbecue okay. do you have at home that you cook on? Um, nothing of note. Um, I've been looking around, actually. Um, again, keep looking at, at all the, the forums. I can't even remember what it's called, like an Outback or something. It's quite yeah. big, yeah. Um, but it's it's not a brand name. I don't need a brand name. This is why I need you know to speak to you guys really talk about barbecues, about is it worth it and that sort of thing. But I did again down to Marcus and the Country Wood Smoke uh, Forum on Facebook. I did buy one of these rotisserie barbecues this year from Home Base. You know the forty quid one. Yeah, Jumbuck. Yeah, I was one of those who did it. Um, uh, there are only so many rotisserie videos that you can see before you just think, right, that's it. <laughs> and I went down to Home Base and I bought their last model. And I I love it, actually. I've used it loads. It is brilliant. I mean, it's only 40 quid and you can't really yeah, I've seen wrong, some awesome people doing some mm. awesome bits on the on the Jumbuck. Uh, yeah. yeah, why not? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Sometimes cheap and cheerful is the way forward. And if it works, then, then why not? I just couldn't, uh, you know when you just can't get something out of your head and you just think, oh, I've, I've got to buy this thing because otherwise it's just going to wind me up and then I'll decide to buy it and I would run out of stock because everybody was saying, oh, you know, my local home base doesn't have one. In fact, some people were like travelling around the country trying to track down these little things. So I thought, I may as well do it. And I, I haven't regretted that one actually. I think I posted a thing on Instagram which is meant to be for knives but this this bought pork, you know, it's at the height of summer and on the rotisserie and the crackling was there and I was like, you know, I felt quite pleased with myself i was very smug posting this video but it was just yeah yeah it's quite good so can't say i've got anything of note but the the you know the passion cool. or the, the need to cook outdoors is, is always there yeah we've got well, no brand snobbery you just got to enjoy yeah. cooking and being that's outside. the beauty that's is that like. you could have a fire on the floor and, yeah. and that could be good enough to to cook on that's that's all you need yeah. so yeah so that's the beauty about outdoor cooking and, and barbecuing is that it can be as, as little or as big as you want it to be. So, so yeah, awesome. But it also this leads me on to this talk about barbecue leads me on to the the barbecue uh, the barbecue knife set that you've recently yeah. sort of announced and, uh, and yeah. I've seen all over <laughs> social media <laughs> taking over my life and I'm looking at these <laughs> brisket slices and stuff like that and I'm like oh my god dreaming about them and just going crazy oh I know do you know what somebody said to me the other day like you know because obviously I've been going ever so slightly nuts on social about this whole thing and they were like you know now nah, I, I don't think enough people know about it I'm like yeah I think there are tribes in the Amazon that don't know about this whole barbecue <laughs> brisket knife thing going on at the minute I have got a bit no it's, it's quite exhausting actually sort of exhaust, um, launching these knives but yeah 
So the it's really difficult actually because there are four that could really cross over to the barbecue. Maybe maybe even five five actually that could cross over to the barbecue um, arena. Um, Marcus. Um, Dr. Sweet Smoke, ow, God love him, and uh, Christian Stevenson, DJ Barbecue, helped me with the knives that I'm going to, let's just dare quote, call them brisket knives, um, that they wanted to have something with e- extra length, so they're 14 inches long, but they are rapiers. They, I literally, <laughs> I held one up the other day, and I was walking around like Luke Skywalker. I don't mind admitting it. They are so, <laughs> so big. And you just can't help, you wield them. Honestly, they're incredible pieces of kit. And Marcus couldn't decide whether um, a serrated edge was better than a flat edge, because he used um, he uses different knives for different things, and he talked about the bark on meat. Yeah. So he said that he needed big, the big debate, big debate in the barbecue world: the yeah. serrated edge to the flat edge. And, yeah, and yeah. So I, I understand. So yeah, he couldn't decide, and neither could neither could Al, Doctor Speech Smoke, and, and and Christian couldn't either. So I thought, well, you know, sod it. Let's just go and do do them both. You know, if if, if there really is a market for both, uh, you know, let's just go for it. So I put. Uh, an idea to um, Marcus, he was like, yeah, 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 absolutely, that's that's exactly what we want. Again, this is backed up by Dr. Sweet Smoke and by um, Christian. And the t- it's really, really difficult to design and make a knife. Is, is ex- It's not easy. I have to say, people think it's really easy. Like They go, oh, I've got a great idea for a knife design. It's so difficult to, to actually make a knife because you kind of have to have a sixth sense about the whole thing, particularly if you're not following a beaten path. Now, I have to say the brisket knives, there's nothing difficult about these particular knives in the sense that they're, 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 they're long. They've, I, know, I knew exactly what depth I wanted. I wanted that depth to be consistent all the way through. I wanted the rounded tip. I, I designed the serrations to be as they were it's that wasn't particularly difficult what is difficult is what handle do you put on them you know do you need the, the larger size handle do you need the mid-size handle you've got to kind of have a a guess really as how it that's going to feel because it's all done on paper once i get the samples through to change them is really really difficult and so all the work is done pre samples arriving really i mean i can make i can make changes but you know it just adds more cost to the whole thing um but it's for when you've got a knife like um wayne's knife the serrati slicer um karen maui's have you seen the, the new bony knife that karen has yes with? that looks now insane that, let's just talk about that for a second because that is incredible this man, honestly, I, I've got I've got to thank him for so much. He designed the Maui Deva, which um, was the very first knife that was designed by somebody outside Joe and I. And um, Joe and I just we either find gaps, um, like for example, we didn't have a bread knife years ago. We didn't have a bread knife, so I sent I think schematics over to Ayesha and said, "Listen, can you make it this long?" You know, and they were like, "What's a bread knife?" You know, literally had no clue. So I had to sort of handhold them through that process. <laughs> But Wayne was the, the first one to come on board and design a knife. And he had this idea, and he was just he was just talking to me one day about um, his, his ideal knife, what he would like. And he didn't know, but I was making notes of everything he was saying. And sent him an email. I said, you know, and I said, you know, is that what you were thinking of? And he was like, yeah, that is actually what I was talking about. And how did you know? And I said, well, you know, I was actually verbatim copying down your your words. And... I knew we were on to something. I knew it was going to be perfect. I just had this feeling. But when the sample came through, I'm not going to lie to you, I actually teared up. It was absolutely <laughs> perfect. I sent a picture of myself with tears in my eyes to Karen and went, oh, my God, it's just brilliant. I, it just, I mean, I, I, yes, sent the knife out to testers for testing, but you just know when you pick up a knife and you see it, you just, you just think that's perfect. And it was absolutely perfect. So when he came to me and said, I've got a knife for another knife, I, I completely trust the man because he got it absolutely spot on last time. This new bony knife is staggering. It's got an inverted handle. I don't know whether you noticed it, but the handle is actually not the right way around. It's upside down. Because, um, again, I'm talking fluently like I know what I'm talking about. I don't debone my meat. I haven't got a clue, so I have to rely on people who know what they're talking about. But he said that 70% of the time um, yeah, when you're deboning, you've actually got the knife. Yeah, yeah, you've got it. So he designed the handle 
that way to begin with. So 30% of the time when you're using it the other way around, so be it. It's such but, a striking knife to look at as well. I mean, it's... It, it, it's a, it's a, like an ice pick thing. Yeah, because like it's such them. a thin blade. It looks such oh. a, a fragile almost blade, but... At the same time, you've got the massive, the, the the big sort of curve at the at the end of the handle that runs right up to this beautifully thin sort of needle-like uh, blade. It, it looks, it's, it is, it's really beautiful, beautiful knife. It is. Work <laughs> Stunning. I've got, I'm actually holding it in my hand that right now, so I don't want you to get too jealous. But it, it's just, <laughs> it's just, I am. I'm waving at you. Um, it's, uh, it's just, it is staggering. It's a, it's a complete stiletto point. It's got the triplex steel, so there's, it's rigid. So there's no flex in it whatsoever. Um, it's just, it's got that beautiful Japanese angle. This actually knife, this knife has been 30 years in the making. He gave me a knife that he based it on that was his mum's, and then he's had it for 18 years, and he'd been sharpening it and sharpening it so much, you know, on a steel. Now, can I just say, butcher steels are the worst way to sharpen your knives. If you want me to come back to that point, I will. But, you know, it's, they're just sent from the devil. <laughs> anyway, he'd been using a butcher steel on it, and it, it got to the point where it was pretty much like the one I've been putting on social. But it was the perfect knife. It had been honed to the point where he wanted to have... So it was like um, fluke. He had, like, sharpened this down and used it so much, and, and eventually yeah. it turned into... <laughs> that that perfect knife that he'd yeah. he'd wanted in the first place. To get there. Yeah, yeah, it, you know, it took it took I say thirty years to get there, um, and the, 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 it's got such a selected point and such a small um, surface area. There's less contact with the meat, so less resistance. It makes everything cleaner, easier. You know, I mean, I'm talking like I know what I'm talking about, but I can imagine exactly how it's used. I've just never actually personally used it myself. Um, but he's just, it, it's just staggering and he sent me a, a text the other day just saying you know this really is a dream come true and I'm like, well to be honest with you of all the knives i've launched and there's been seven of them that i've been launching over the last couple of weeks which i'll never do again that was so sort of difficult work this one has received the most attention and i mean positive attention as well um from butchers from chefs and i've got have so many um dms from people begging to have a, a go at testing but there are only ten in the um, in the world, actually. Wow. Um, yeah. So. Um, and you're holding one in your hand <laughs> right now. And I have one in my hands. Yeah, right now. But it's got the mid-sized handle, which balances it perfectly with the length. It's just, you know, I can just see this. I said it, it could be um, a game changer. This bony knife could actually be the bony knife that everybody will have because it's just an impre- incredible tool. I, I think, it, and because it's Japanese steel, it's really, really hard, so it won't wear down. You know, it's just you've got a bony knife that will see you, see you out. So as long as obviously you take care of it, but yeah, it's exciting. Amazing, yeah, massively. Yeah. We so we got the bony knife, we got the two brisket knives, then we got the Wayne Serasi slicer, which is um, a, a ten-inch slicing knife with a beautiful curve and a tanto point, and that's just. It's so graceful to use, and again, that's got the new mid-sized handle, so it feels lighter than a normal Irish head. It's just, it's just beautiful. And then, what else have we got? I'm just looking at them now. Oh, and then we've got Daniel Clifford's knife, um, which is more of a fish knife, to be fair. It sort of doesn't really cross over to barbecue. Um, and then I got really jealous of all the guys designing these knives. I snuck in one of my own, so I've got this little baby um, Santuku blade called the Chaikon Slicer, which is my little thing, so... I didn't feel left out. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I got really jealous. So I was at said in February, and I was like to, talking to the guys, you know, the, the guys through, you know, what I wanted from each blade. And I was like, hang on a second, <laughs> I need to put one in here because it's fun designing a knife is fun, but it's, you know, it's exciting, it is exhilarating, but it's nerve wracking. And you know, when you're when the jury is out on your knife and you put your heart and your soul into a design, it's. I mean, I really feel for the guys right now because their knives are being tested by. Some of the elite. I mean, the, the bony knife, for example, that's gone into the hands of Daniel Clifford, uh, Michael Wignall, Tommy Banks, uh, Tim Allen, and then some Jason Erdil mates, his head butcher there, and some, some other guys. So he's now, he's now absolutely bricking Just himself. some of the guys. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, between the, the four chefs, there are six stars between them, and they were chosen carefully um, because they needed to be able to butcher you know it's, it, it they had to have a, a leaning in that direction as mm-hmm. well so um yeah i mean it's gut-wrenching when it goes wrong i mean daniel clifford's first design didn't go right at all and each one of these samples cost me a thousand pounds 
So when it doesn't go right, it's expensive. Yeah. But it's not just that. It's just you... you Ooh, um, Dan, you're you lucky right. to get another shot there. Yeah. Then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I do what, Launching seven knives, it's been... Yeah. It's, it's, I, I think the barbecue wave has been it's been incredible and i've really enjoyed the ride and i'd still continue to enjoy the ride i think it's it's just fantastic it gets people together it gets them talking gives them a new passion it's you know everything about it is good there's not a single negative that i can think about that the whole thing um and if i didn't do i, I already had uh, wayne's knife and development and daniel's but if i didn't jump on the back of the, the barbecue wave as well you've be missing out on so much and i think other people would be missing out on the, the you know being able to have a really incredible piece of kit so launching seven knives although it's practically bankrupt me i think it will be you know 2017 will be a really good year for the brand because awesome yeah yeah hope so <laughs> well i hope so too i'm trying to bet the farm so <laughs> we'll see <clears throat> Yeah. So but, you kind yeah. of you, you touched on it then just briefly. You said, "Oh, this will last you all the way through as long as you look after it." So mm. can you give us some tips on like how to look after your knife, like how what should we do, where should we store them, how should we clean them? Well, dishwashers are a no-no. Um, you might uh, people listening. I forgot that we're actually recording for a show, but um, that we'll probably go. Yeah, I kind of that get that, time. but I don't understand why. <laughs> do you? You go off on tangents and go. Oh yeah, I actually meant to be recording. This. Really, it's just for um, us. Yeah. If anyone listens, it's fine. <laughs> We're just enjoying a chat. <laughs> yeah. It's just a social thing. It's great. Um, but the dishwasher is the salt in the dishwasher is corrosive. Um, salt to stainless steel is like cancer. Um, do you remember in the olden days where you used to watch the olden days? We you'd watch a car to go down the street and it was an old bang and it got rust on it. Once that piece of um, panel of a car got rust, it, it's gone. Once rust takes hold, that's it. You've, you've lost that that knife. And so the salt in dishwashers is just hideous for stainless steel. The high temperatures as well is not great, um, particularly with Irish and knives, because in, in the handle, it's not that sort of branding that you see. is isn't um, an etching uh, or a sticker. It actually goes all the way through the tank. So there's so much steel that's in... The yeah, handle, I just saw that. I was looking way. on the website when I clicked on the little image of it. You can see like the inside of the handle, and I, I just assumed it was just like a design on the outside. Yeah, yeah, you're not alone. Yeah. A lot of people do. Yeah. So what's that? Um, is that for like weighting then? Is that for weight and balance of the knife? Is that exactly? Yeah, oh, okay. it's exactly that. Yeah, and you know we just did it with a bit of style with the you know the Irish end swoosh on the handle. So um, awesome. That's there's so much there is weight in there. There's so much steel that's in there. So the high temperatures of the Dishwasher will expand the steel. So dishwasher's a no-no. Don't go anywhere yeah, near no, it. No. I don't know. Do not no, go no. near the dishwasher with your Irish end knife. No, it's, a, it's terrible, terrible. For anything, you know, high-quality glassware, you'd never put in a dishwasher because, it, you know, it stains the, the glass. So that, but if you're going to put them uh, in the drawer, that's no problem, but you need to have blade guards because otherwise they're jangling around in the drawer. It's, they're blunting. They're, it's a, a hazard. I, I still mine on the knife rack under the cupboards in my kitchen we sell knife blocks um you know so you can actually have them on the side some people like them as a showpiece um but as long as the blade is protected that's the most important thing so whatever however you're storing it as long as it's not being touched by foreign objects and bashed about and what have you that's that's perfectly fine are those you know? magnetic knife blocks like the best way to store them because i've got like a wooden knife block but i don't <coughs> know if like sliding the knives in and out of the wood whether that's blunting them and putting them in there yeah, it, it does, although wood's quite forgiving, so it's not the, the most hideous thing. But if you can imagine, um, you, let's give you a visual here. You've got the, your window sill at home, and you don't dust it for a couple of weeks. You know, one, there's a load of dust on the side, and two, there's some dead flies and all sorts of stuff. Same thing with the bottom of your block. So you put the knife in, it's lovely and clean. You put oh, your knife in your wooden yeah. knife block, and it, it comes into contact with dust, with, I say, with <laughs> dead insects, all sorts, and you pull it out, Never and there you go, your house again. I'm taking all my knives out. <laughs> <laughs> it's really, it's uh, so unhygienic, so Ben's that's why we produce oh. that. <laughs> yeah. You're probably gipping now, going, oh my God. But yeah, so you never wash, you never wash your knife once you take it out of the knife block, because you think it's clean, because it went tinkling, but actually it's, it's completely contaminated with all sorts of horrible stuff, so. Oh, I don't go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Sorry about that. 
So I ordered one of your magnetic blocks. Then. <laughs> yeah, so say there, there is an option. It's not for everybody. Some people don't like it. Some people want the works that be secure. But it just, you know, a lot of people do like it because it is. You can actually add to your collection and. And when they're so beautiful like this, you got to show them off. They're like little works of art, aren't they? It's like a yeah. No it's art kind display. of knives are kind of like you buy like cars you kind of buy into a bit of a lifestyle yeah. when you buy a knife and i didn't realize that until sort of starting this thing but it, it, they are sort of style icons you've got a sexy knife thing. you want to show it off yeah i agree <laughs> I don't know I, if I have I room do. for the lightsaber one on especially my if it's like a, a 14 inch uh <laughs> chassis <laughs> <laughs> right uh, okay you also touched on sharpening you said that the butcher steels are a no-no so, mm. so what? What are people? What What should people be using? Well, there are good, bad, and ugly ways of sharpening your knife. The, the, without a shadow of a doubt, the the worst way to sharpen your knife is using a butcher's steel. Now, I do realise that that is quite offensive to some people because they've been taught by their granddad or their dad or they've been doing it all their life. But I used to do exhibitions with a commercial knife sharpening machine and sell to butchers. And can you imagine, and butchers, when they come to these exhibitions like Foodex, Meatex and what have you at the NEC, they don't come on their own. They come with a potty and they're quite intimidating. Can you imagine saying to a butcher what he's been doing his entire life to a knife is actually the most hideous thing you could ever do without backing it up with the goods. Um, and I do a, a blunt to sharpen demonstration on the machine in 20 seconds and their jaw drops and they buy one and everybody's happy. But there is science behind, you know, me sort of saying that it's, it's hideous. When you're using a butcher steel, you can never hit the same place twice. You try to, but you just can't do it. So you end up bashing the tip at different angles. So instead of having a beautiful clean line from uh, the, all the way down the blade, at one angle and all the time at one angle, you end up hitting the, the edge at different different angles and it produces what they call a shoulder on the knife. Now, I would never argue with somebody that they couldn't get a knife sharp using a steel. I would say that it's a worse way to get a knife sharp because that tip with that, um, with that angle that has been given to it by the steel is about, it's about 45 degrees instead of what I consider the best angle, which is 15 degrees. So the tip is under a lot of strain and a lot of load and it rounds and blunts really, really quickly, which is why when you go to a butcher's and they're using a traditional method method of sharpening, every third customer, you can hear them in the back going Mm. with their steel because within three customers, the knife is blunt. They just, you know, they cannot keep that edge. So steels are terrible. And the other thing is you can't get from the um, heel to the tip every single time. So knives that have been sharpened using a butcher's steel, you can see them a mile off. They've got this bow in the middle of the knife. And if you try and chop a carrot, <laughs> it won't hit the board because it's got this, this curve right bang smack in the middle. Just terrible for knives. Um, next level on, so not, not terrible, is the, the manual pull-throughs. Now, again, you can get really terrible manual pull-throughs that are just made, just, they just put them together because they can. Um, the tungsten carbide used to... Um, sharpen the knives is so aggressive it just rips good quality steel to pieces the manual pull throughs from global for example are really good there's a guy called mino shark who produces a, a range of manual pull throughs they're great they are actually really good for knives however if you look at the sharpening angles of the stones those are also set at 45 degrees so your knife will build up the shoulder over time but they're not bad for a quick fix and they're I don't know about well, they're between forty and and sort of sixty pounds, I think. So that you know, they're not hideous. Whetstones are brilliant, and if you can learn to use a whetstone, it's like riding a bike. It's a skill you never lose. Um, if you've got a knife that has completely lost its edge and is really dull and blunt, then you start on your coarse grits and you work up your grades to get really, really fine grit, and you can make a nice thing on a whetstone. <laughs> It's beautiful, but so much work. If you've let your knife go, it's there a lot of work to get back. And we're talking an hour plus. Wow. It's hard work. Mm. And muscles ache. It's good. Yeah, I suppose it's a good workout, <laughs> but they're good. They're, and I, I have a range of, of whetstones if you know, people want to go in that direction. I also have electric knife sharpening machines, which are angle controlled. So they lock you in at 15 degrees and, you know, it's, it's just a quick fix. And, you know, they're, they're about the price of a whetstone to be fair and i i do knife sharpening um you know i i run knife sharpening skill courses or knife courses so i teach people about the blade and different parts of the knife to use and all that sort of stuff and, and i do cover knife sharpening and i will blunt a knife down and use a whetstone to to bring it back and 
it takes me about 20 minutes to get, you know, a fairly decent result. And I'll fill the 20 minutes talking, well, nonsense, like I'm talking now to you guys, really. I don't know. I don't know what I talk about. You do. You sharpen but, knives there. Well, it's just, it's just, I just talk drivel most of the time. But, you know, I'll pass it around to everybody and they'll ooh and they'll ah and we'll have a tomato and they'll go, yeah, yeah, that's brilliant. Well done. That's great. And you show me how to use it. But as soon as like, that knife is done the rounds, it will come back to me, and I'll blunt it again on the back of another knife. And you can see people physically go, no, you know, literally trying to grab the knife out of my hand because I spent 20 minutes 20 sharpening minutes. it up. And within a minute on my electric knife sharpening machine, less than a minute, I've got it back. And I say, well, you know, I can teach you how to wet, use a whetstone, and I obviously have. But if you don't have the time, <laughs> you can't get it, and you don't just, you know, buy a knife sharpening machine. It's, it's just as quick, and it's, it's easy, and... You know, we sell bucket loads of them anyway, so it's, it's, you know, but they're just, they're completely de-skilled, the whole process of knife sharpening. And it's not for everybody, and some people turn their noses up at knife sharpening machines, and that's fine. But I have, alter- you know, I have alternatives. Mm. You have, like, there's three that are listed on your website. What's the like, difference <clears throat> yeah. in those three different ones? Yeah, I've got domestic, professional, commercial. So the domestic model is Let's Pigeonhole for Mr. and Mrs. Jones. They're, they're at home. They they just want their knife sharp. They want something that's quick, it's easy. You know, the the wheels never wear down. They come with a lifetime guarantee. It's got a brilliant, high quality motor. It's fantastic. But because it's essentially a mini grinder, on the last millimeter of the edge, you will see tiny cutting marks. And most people don't know they're there. You, you know, most people don't feel them, and most people don't just don't care. They've got their knife sharp, and they they're really really happy. But if um if I gave that knife to a butcher um under a microscope you can actually see the t- it's tiny chips along the blade they would feel the the chips they call it drag and they'd feel it going through the meat so they want to go to the next level up so they would want the professional or the commercial machine um if you're that registered go for the commercial if you're not then you'd go for the, the professional but they both use belts um, and they produce a polished mirror finish to your knife, and it, it, it gets a knife back to box sharp without the, the grinding. It, it essentially sharpens and polishes the knife at the same time. It's really, really kind to blades, um, and that's the one I use, you know, on my knives. And with that one, you just replace the belts when they wear out, then, do you? Yeah, yeah, they, they, they only use half a belt when you're sharpening, and then you just turn the belt around. And actually, I keep the worn belts as spares. So when you've sharpened your knife, and it's all lovely and beautiful if you put the worn belts back on the machine and just finish off with a couple of passes of the worn belt it's like using the old uh, strop and leather mm. or you know it, it's just oh my god i can take a, <laughs> we're talking about global again i can take a global knife sharper than when it comes brand new out of the manufacturer you can turn it into um, an iron shell almost <laughs> 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 almost not almost quite. not quite but <laughs> but yeah yeah so they, those two are fantastic machines so Cool. So I have sharpening solutions, and that, again, that's what's so good about the Good Food Show is that you can talk people through their various options. But the latter two I've been talking about are really for the hardcore knife users, you know, and um, the the businesses, you know, that sort of thing. Awesome, cool. And I've okay. also seen on your blades that you like do little engravings and stuff. I've seen like Andy yeah. Lowenslow has got his own little like logo on there, and. Got yeah, Chase seen loads of them. Uh, Jamie Gibson, uh, yeah. one of those on the podcast the other day. Yeah. Uh, he Holden, had his Richard Holden. Yeah, got had his uh, the two knives. Is it two knives? It is the two knives? So yeah, three knives. Yeah, three knives. Yeah, and uh, <coughs> David Flatman. Yeah. He had yeah. his. Yeah. Everyone. I mean, just been seeing everyone's. Uh, Daniel Clifford. He had his engraved as well. Yeah. I've, I've just been seeing everyone's just personalised blades, and they look absolutely tremendous. It, there's something quite special actually when you when you personalize a blade i always consider ISM my babies but the minute they've been um engraved with somebody else's design or their their name you know they, they become property of that person and it's, re- it's really quite special i love doing the engraving side of things and it could be something as simple as a text or you know i've done movie quotes i've done music lyrics i've done life mottos you know sometimes it's just the twitter handle um or you know whatever's going on on social media but that's all done on one machine. I've got a, a, an etching machine, which um, <laughs> that that machine is called Chips and Gravy. And then I've got another machine called Enrique and Gravy F. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> so when that one actually is a pixelating machine, so I can recreate pictures. So if you've wow. got a really intricate logo, I did one. Um, oh, it's a barbecue. Hang on, it'll come back to me in a minute. With a, 
it was a barbecue um, and that we had the, the flames and smoke coming up and it was kind of distorted. It'll come back to me in just a second. Amazing logo to work with. Really, really intricate. And, and rather than etch it out, um, it's actually pixelated. So it just taps out the image. It taps out what it sees. Awesome. So I can recreate um, movie scenes. I've done, I've got one downstairs and I've recreated two scenes from Star Wars on a Santuku blade. <laughs> it's really, really, really epic. Uh, this is good with their lightsaber actions yeah. and sounds. Yeah, She's yeah, now got the... <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a Star Wars fan. You might have actually um, guessed that by now. But yeah, it's and I can put pictures on there. I mean, if you're a chef, you cannot have pictures of your loved ones at, at work. You know, you can't, you know, unless you're obviously the head chef and you've got your own office. You can't have pictures. So a lot of chefs have their families. There's a picture of the family on the on the blade and they can look down and go, ah, oh, that's why I work crazy hours. That's why I'm getting paid nice. you know, very little. You know, that's why I miss holidays and, and birthdays and, you know, and, and it's that sort of thing. So, yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun. I have to say, engraving is, 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 is a hobby more than a than a business side of things. I really enjoy it. So if you, if you want to get that done, do you buy the knives and send them to you to get them engraved? or Actually, that's when they would buy direct from me. Yeah. Because, um, you know, even if you just wanted, a, like, your name, you know, we, we would talk about the size, the font, um, there's so many to choose from. Yeah. And um, we, we sort of, I would talk through the process. Sometimes it's really simple, sometimes there are lots of questions, but, uh, yeah, that's when I would talk to them direct. Awesome. Lucky them. Yeah. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Regret picking up the phone. <laughs> do people normally just have it on one side, or do they have it on like both sides of the knife? Um, it, it depends on how much money they've got to spend. Yes. Um, a friend of mine actually had a totem pole of sugar skulls going all the way up. Wow. Um, he had a sashimi. His name's Craig. He's really, in fact, Craig is awesome. He's the one who sort of got me into Instagram, actually. Um, and the, the, the power of Instagram. And he came to the office, and I literally had sugar skulls going all the way up his um, sashimi knife that he uses for awesome. um, carving. Yeah, it really is awesome, actually. <laughs> it's just incredible. And with that particular machine, it's it's 3D, so it's almost like the 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 skulls are jumping out at you. It's quite dark, but really good. <laughs> I have to, is it on your Instagram, is it? I have to go on and have a look. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, go on on the Instagram, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, cool. you know, I try and keep the Instagram corporate, but, you know, if you've got to use the two corporate, people get bored, don't they? So, um, yeah, some, there are some stupid things that go in there. <laughs> so, my passion for crayfishing, which luckily for everybody who joins now is, is over. The crayfishing season, season's over, but I do go a bit nuts on the. <laughs> <season>. <laughs> <Cool>. <laughs> Right, we are we are over the hour mark, so I'm going to call oh it a goodness. day there. But I mean, um, we may have to have a part two at some point because yeah. uh, into that. <laughs> still I more to talk about. <laughs> no, definitely <laughs> not. Definitely not. Thank you very much for coming on. Could You're you? welcome. Thank you ever so much for having me. It's been it's been a really really fun experience. Thank you. Oh, we loved it. Thank yeah, you. Great. Um, could you just remind everyone where they can find you on social media and online? Well, the um, Twitter is at Ioshen Knives, and I think it's probably the same for Instagram. And then uh, it's just ioshen.co.uk. Um, and again, I think Ioshen on Facebook as well. Awesome. So many platforms. Yeah, so cool. Get on there, follow them up if you're not already, and check them out. It's yeah, awesome cool. Awesome knives. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for being Thank on you very today. much, Natalie. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Wicked. Chat Cheers soon. soon. Bye. 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 Thanks for tuning in, guys. We've recorded yet another awesome podcast to get you over hump day. As always, we're brought to you by ProQ, Barbecue Gourmet, Commander Joe, and Smoke with Chack, our awesome sponsors. ProQ is dedicated to providing with quality smoking products with top-notch service and free advice for beginners and pitmasters. And you can find them on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram under ProQ Smokers. So if you think about buying your first smoker, wanting to upgrade, or looking for authentic charcoal commercial smokers, check them out over at Max Barbecue. Barbecue Gourmet is devoted to promoting real barbecue and supplying the UK and Europe with top championship winning barbecue rubs, sauces, marinades and accessories from the US and around the world and you can find them on Twitter and online under Barbecue Gourmet. So regardless of how you cook, whether it's on charcoal, wood, gas or electric, the real taste of barbecue can be yours all year round. And Commander Joe is renowned for build, quality and innovation. From smoking, roasting or searing, Commander Joe is the premium ceramic grill chosen by Michelin star chefs and barbecue enthusiasts alike. Kamado Joe's patented technology lets you cook with confidence and stay in complete control. Get that real, get that great barbecue taste and keep the moisture locked into your food. Check out kamadojoe.co.uk plus Facebook and Twitter. 
and Smoke with Shack delivers quality smoking wood every time. They provide the smoky goodness, you provide the talent. So if you're looking for smoking wood chunks, dust, chips, planks, then head on over to smokewithshack.com and you can find them on Twitter at Smoke with Shack. And goodbye from me. And goodbye from me. And buy our book on Amazon, please. Thank you. Yeah, well, let's just quickly have a what? quick chat about that. It's, it's out. We already said we're over the hour. but Okay, we are over the hour. But uh, yeah, so. check out the Wicked Book. Where thank you for the support already. Yeah. Thank you to everyone that's been on and ordered some. Uh, it was wicked to be at the number one spot there on the Amazon bestsellers. Loved that. Yeah. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, thank you for your ongoing support and uh, check it out, it. guys. Enjoy. Ben and Dan's Alfresco Christmas. Obviously, my recipes are the best, but. <laughs>